of you who are here know Mike and myself. Um, we're both partners at Bergston, Flynn and Knowlton. We provide a litany of services to um, real estate clients, developers, landlords, tenants, homeowners, um, real estate brokers, uh, institutional um, investors. And um, we're joined today by Lauren Davidson and Joe Roberta. Um, Lauren uh, started in real estate back in 2006 at Cushman Wakefield. She's been at Trans Western for the last seven and a half years representing tenants and landlords on leasing transactions. Uh, she's senior vice president there. We're really happy to have her with us. And Joe Roberta is with Lockton. He's a partner at Lockton, which is the largest privately held insurance brokerage in the world. Um, she's, he started in commercial insurance in 2002, and we're equally excited to have him to give us some background on um, mostly business interruption insurance, which we're gonna get into later on in the program. Um, but I wanted to quickly start by just kind of giving an overview of why we're doing this. And I touched on that at the outset, which is commercial tenants are asking us, do we have to pay rent? Um, commercial landlords are asking us what's gonna happen when my commercial tenant inevitably comes to me and says, I can't pay rent next month or I can't pay rent the month after that. Um, and this all kind of emanates, obviously one from, from Corona, but two from um, the, uh, the governor's order from last, was it Friday, Mike? Friday or Saturday? It issued this Friday, went into effect at 8 p.m. on Sunday. Yeah, the New York State on pause executive order, um, which I'm going to try to share really quickly here. Is that working? Oh, wow. That's an improvement from the last one. This is not it. <laughs> well, you got the tech was right, just not the attachment. Yeah. Okay. You seeing this? Yeah. Okay. So um, the, the thrust of the order is that only essential businesses or entities can continue to operate um, in office. Obviously, we're all operating out of office right now. We're off are operating remotely this has an impact on a slew of industries but um and you know if you want to take a closer look the order kind of spells out all the essential industries leaving everything else is non-essential uh meaning that they can't operate in house and that's had obviously a major impact on retail outlets restaurants um anything that needs kind of a brick and mortar presence in order to operate at full capacity uh, and that is going to have an impact on their ability to operate moving forward and inevitably it's going to have an, uh, an impact on, on their commercial leases. So Mike's going to cover some of the contractual provisions and typical leases that might be impacted by Corona and by this order. I'll take a, a really quick look at um, some outside of the contract defenses that businesses or landlords might want to point to or might be grappling with over the course of the next few weeks and months and God years, um, and then we'll we'll turn to Lauren and Joe to talk about some um, practical considerations from a broker and insurance perspective that might be useful to people who are on this call and people who are watching it later on. Great. So I, you want me to take it away, Lee? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we'll we'll touch first on contractual remedies or contractual contractual clauses that address this. Um, it's it's sort of. A short conversation because frankly uh, most of the provisions in a lease in a commercial lease that are going to excuse the payment of rent relate to interruption of, of services that are due to some act or omission on the part of the landlord uh, so if utilities can't be provided and and I should mention it doesn't always provide for a rent abatement up front uh, New York City landlords in particular are very careful uh, not to give rent abatements when they absolutely don't have to within the four corners of a lease. Um, so unless a landlord is actually closing the building, uh, most commercial leases will say the tenant has 24 seven access to the building. Uh, so short of the landlord saying you cannot enter the building, I'm not gonna have it open to you. Uh, it's very hard to say that the landlord is not holding up his end of the bargain, uh, particularly if it's a gross lease and the utilities all are, are provided to the building and those are all intact. Uh, it's something like this is kind of a novel situation where tenants cannot go into their space and do their business there, uh, but it really has nothing to do with the landlord whatsoever. Um, 
So we're left in many cases looking at what we call a force majeure provision, uh, which essentially just means, you know, an, an act of God or some unforeseen, uncontrollable event that stops the parties from being able to perform uh, their end of the bargain in a contract. What makes commercial leases kind of unique is that most force majeure clauses just address the landlord's excusive performance. So a typical force majeure clause will say, and Lee, I think we have, we have something to share on that, um, or that might have been the interruption of services provision. That's the interruption of services provision. So we, can, we can put that back up after, um, but essentially what it will say is, uh, if there is some reason that, that the landlord cannot provide utilities or other services or can't open the building, and it's, it's outside of the landlord's control, you can get very specific with it or you can be vague with it. Uh, those things will actually uh, you know, not excuse the payment of rent. Landlords will try to limit it to situations where uh, if it's their act or omission uh, that, that causes a stoppage uh, or an interruption in your ability to use the space, that's where you, you would get, uh, you'd have a strong case for an abatement of rent. Um, it's often silent with respect to the tenant, uh, and they, these are very narrowly construed. So it is very difficult for a tenant to say, even if, if we're relying just on the common law, because there's not, nothing written in the lease about the tenant's rights in a force majeure situation. Uh, it's, if the tenant is able to write a check, essentially, and pay the rent, uh, the argument that most landlords make usually successfully is that they have to continue making those rent payments. Um, some of the other provisions that we've, we've been looking at these provisions for two weeks now, um, and some of the tougher cases to make might be a taking provision. Most leases account for, uh, you know, eminent domain or governmental taking. This, this is unprecedented on that level also, because normally that would be a situation where the space is physically taken, the property is physically taken by a governmental entity. Here, they're not really taking the space. They're essentially saying you cannot go into your space and you cannot do business there. Um, and something to keep in mind with those, even if those prove to be successful, uh, in a normal eminent domain or taking case, remember it's the landlord and the tenant that are both losing out there. So to the extent that there's lost value from the government taking your space, the landlord is gonna to wanna to see some of that value also, because just like you can't go in and conduct business, they can't have the space be used for its intended purpose. So there's not a lot of precedent for how that value or that lost value gets allocated between landlord and tenant. Um, that's, that more or less covers it. Uh, Lee, I don't know if you wanna put up that sample provision for interruption of services. But yeah, uh, so too much more uh, within the contract that typically covers this. Right. So this is going to be a lease that many of you who are on uh, this call right now, that that provision is going to be a provision that, you, that you're probably familiar with. It's in most leases. And let's see, interruption of services. Is it showing up? It's showing up. Okay. And actually, the paragraph A, I would say, is in most leases. Paragraph B would be something that you, a tenant or, or their lawyer would have to negotiate for uh, because that actually provides for an abatement after a certain period of time. It's, it's spelled out that after 72 hours, if there's an interruption of service, that there'd be an abatement. Uh, so that's, that's probably not gonna show up in the initial lease draft from the landlord. Right, so if you do have something, if you're a tenant and you have something like clause B, which provides for an abatement in the event that services are inter interrupted for a period of time, the number in there is 72 hours, it might be five days, it might be 10 days, whatever it is. Um, that's obviously a tool that you'll have in your toolbox when you're negotiating with the landlord. Conversely, if you're the landlord and no such clause exists uh, and only clause A or some variation of clause A exists, you're gonna have a lot more leverage in your negotiations with if they come to you and say, we can't or we refuse to pay rent next month or the month after that or whatever. So when you're reviewing your leases, which we're going to encourage everybody on this call to do, hopefully you have your lease somewhere that you're able to access it. If not, ask the lawyer who drafted the lease, they should have a copy of it or, or management or the other side, uh, the landlord or the tenant as it were. Um, you're going to look for 
clauses like this. So if you want to do a very quick and dirty search, you can open your PDF and control F, look for the word abatement, look for the word interruption. Um, that probably will govern from a contractual perspective, the majority of the rights and remedies of the, the, the different parties. Force my, daughter, my, my daughter's trying to break into the room. Right now, so. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh... And actually, I, a lot of leases, you know, sometimes you'll have a form Rebney lease or bar association lease with a rider. Uh, but if you have a more modern, you know, word document based lease, it probably has a, a pretty detailed table of contents. Uh, and so if you're, if you're just stuck with a print copy and you don't have something where you can hit control F, uh, hopefully you have a table of contents to help you find the, the terms or, or at least good subject headers uh, for the sections and articles. Or send it to somebody with a better Adobe than, than you have. <laughs> yeah, time to know. make friends in this crisis, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Mike, is that, are those the kind of main contractual provisions that landlords and tenants should be able to look out for? Yeah, I think we, you know, if we, some of the other things, it's gonna start to cross over into common law defenses and arguments. So we yeah. might come back to a couple of them because uh, there's a little bit of an overlap, but yeah. if we could jump in on that, uh, that's probably the next place we'd go. Okay, so I'm gonna really quickly go through some, some out of the four corners of the lease remedies that tenants might look to. Um, and it's, it's really unclear what is gonna be the outcome of invoking some of these defenses because this is such a novel, I hate to use the word novel because it's the, the novel coronavirus or, or the novel COVID, but this is such a novel situation that it's not clear how the courts are going to respond which if you're looking to renegotiate your position is actually probably a good thing for you if you're a tenant, because um, you can use that uncertainty to try to negotiate more favorable terms with the landlord because it's not clear whether the court is going to widen its stance. With respect to all of these defenses, the court uh, has applied them in the past in New York very, very narrowly. So if the lease doesn't speak to something, then it's very unlikely that um, you're gonna get out of performance, whether you're the landlord or the tenant. But again, because this is such a new circumstance, because we don't really know how the courts are going to approach it, um, you can use some of these defenses if you're the tenant uh, from a leverage perspective. So the, the first one, the first two are, well, actually all three of them are kind of intertwined, but the first one is called impossibility. Um, and that's when a supervening event in this case, there's two supervening events, there's the virus and then there's the government's the governor's order um, makes performance impossible. And typically the uh, impossible event is gonna be death of one of the parties or destruction of the subject matter of the agreement. So if, for instance, your retail store was destroyed by a tornado or an earthquake or some other natural event, that would typically uh, be the kind of impossib the impossibility preceding event that a court would look at. The question is whether or not this event um, makes performance impossible. And I think there are at least, you know, arguments, good faith arguments, maybe not winning arguments, but good faith arguments on the tenant side. Impracticability is kind of a subset of impossibility. It's rendering the performance impracticable by the supervening event, same thing, Corona or the, the governor's order. And there are four factors there. It has to render performance unduly burdensome non-occurrence of the event had to be an assumption of the parties at the time they entered into the deal. So obviously all leases that preceded Corona, the parties were not thinking about Corona or a pandemic or something that would basically shut down the economy at the time they entered into the agreement. And the affected party has to not be responsible for it, which is obviously not the case here. Typically change in economic situations, so that the market tanking, a depression, um, interest rates changing, that's not going to invoke this defense. But again, this is not just the economic conditions changing, this is uh, more than that. So the question is going to be whether or not a court looks at it differently. Frustration of purpose is very similar to impossibility and impracticability. Um, it's basically when the primary purpose of the contract is frustrated by the event. So the purpose of the contract is no longer valuable in this case, the purpose is obviously to use and occupy space. So if you are the tenant, the argument you would make is um, 
the coronavirus and then the governor's order has has rendered the purpose of um, of the lease frustrated. And then one other kind of uh, additional common law defense that I don't really know how it's going to play out, and it touches on something that Mike said, is um, considering bringing an inverse condemnation or eminent domain proceeding against, this would be against the city or the state, um, for the order that effectively shut down the business. Uh, I don't, there's not much case law in this territory either for something like this because um, it's rare in the history of our country that there's been a you know, shelter in place emanating from a pandemic disease. It's first time. So I'm sure some of those actions are gonna take place. That really wouldn't provide you with any leverage against the landlord. That's uh, an action for a tenant to consider against a municipality for the action that it took, in this case, New York State. Um, so those are kind of the inside the contract and outside the contract leverage points. And then the question is, how do you use that leverage? Um, how do you interact with landlord or tenant to try to collaborate and work out something that's gonna, if you're the tenant, keep, keep you in business, if you're the landlord, um, preserve all of your interests, whether you're a mom and pop landlord or whether you're an institutional landlord, you're gonna have interests that um, require rent coming in the door. So the I think, first- I think Phil actually, Philip actually queued up the right question if you if you open up the chats that's the perfect segue yeah I think ultimately it's going to need to be litigated uh, and most small businesses aren't in a position of arguing such a landmark case against the massive landlord in a lot of cases in manhattan so what's the best way to handle this in the short term for small businesses that's a, it's a perfect segue i think yeah. to joe and lauren because uh, the answer is in a lot of cases we're going to want to settle this with a practical business solution and, and not have to litigate this yeah so um the first thing is is uh, that a lot of businesses are doing are, are looking to their insurance carriers, which is why we asked Joe to, to come on. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting a lot of questions. You know, we've been talking to, the, to um, clients who have retail spaces and they don't even know the phrase business interruption insurance. I'm sure more and more they're, they're becoming familiar with it. So can you really kind of, you know, quickly explain to us what it is and how it might apply here? Yeah, of course. And before I jump in, just want to see Lee, Michael, you guys can hear me, correct? The microphone? Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. 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 So, yeah, so obviously we're spending a lot of time with our clients and it's ranging from really small outfits and shops of a few individuals and ranging all the way up to the Fortune 100. So it's, it's, uh, it's had a lot of impact already on a lot of businesses and depending where you are from a geography standpoint, could have more impact depending on the industry, could have more impact. But uh, to start off with Lee, when you have a business interruption loss, Essentially, what you typically would see would be damage to a location, could be an office, could be a warehouse, could be a manufacturing plant, where you can no longer utilize that location. And as such, you're now losing revenue in your business because you don't have access to your, to your property. Um, the discussion we're really having a lot, to Lee's point, is do you have coverage under your policy for COVID-19? And just to walk through kind of the high-level process, what we take each client down, every policy is unique every policy is different. So when we first get our hands on, on a client's policy, first thing we're looking for, is there a specific exclusion that actually gets rid of coverage for a virus? And I'd say maybe 10, 15% of policies out there might have a, a specific exclusion that says not covering virus. It could be in a virus endorsement. It could be inside the coverage form. It could be baked away in a virus bacteria or a pollution endorsement. So as you look at firms, whether it's on a brokerage side or on a legal side, that's where a lot of the folks spend your time to see, is there a specific exclusion? For clients that don't have a specific exclusion, we then look at the policy and see, is there an affirmative grant of coverage? Meaning you actually either have a sublimit that says in black and white, you have $100,000 of coverage or a million dollars worth of coverage for virus. Sometimes it could be baked again, part of a virus bacteria or a pollution extension that's built in. In those cases, a lot of times you're gonna have coverage under the current situation, although it's not that easy. Um, where most folks land, and it's gonna tie back to the second point, is the policy tends to remain silent. So the challenge that a lot of the clients that we, that we work with are gonna have with the carriers is gonna be proving that COVID-19 is direct physical damage to the location. And the reason I say that is, without getting too granular and too in depth, but 
99% of the property policies that are written out there are gonna say you need to have direct physical damage of loss for any coverage to apply. So for the policy to even trigger and start kicking in for a business interruption coverage, you need to really evidence that direct physical damage. We've had clients already that we're helping support putting claims where we're alleging that COVID-19 is direct physical damage and stretching it into what's known as a peril of the policy. Or we're also take, taking the approach of helping clients start collecting all the information they need from a business income, business interruption loss. And I can, I can pass it along to folks if they wanna see what, what, that, what that information looks like post-call. Um, and recommending, you know, it might, might be worth putting your carrier on notice. Even if you think that, that the policy historically hadn't really covered a virus, what we're seeing is with certain states already, and maybe even at, at a federal level, they might actually stretch the policy or mandate that carriers have to step up and, and play, pay for business interruption losses. So uh, I'm going to get into that in a little bit of a second here, but um, because Lee and Michael, I can hear you guys, just from a business interruption, I kind of gave a high level description and was walking down a policy. Um, do you think I should get any more granular? Any questions you guys might have that I can address before I get into the, what the states and government might be doing? I guess the one question is, what, what would the notice provision typically look like for that? And is there constructive notice given by virtue of the fact that this is something every business is experiencing? Or is that a question for us to, to yeah, no, 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 it's a great question. So the way it really looks, it, it could be your broker or if you're working directly with a carrier, which is a little less common now, but your broker agent would put in an email or a formal letter and just saying, we're putting you on notice for a business interruption loss. And in reality, that's gonna sit there all the way until you don't have a disruption of loss. So there's not necessarily a rush to have to do this at this point in time in a sense that you're not going to breach any reporting requirements on the policy if you wait to near the end of the loss. Um, but I think we're recommending just put, it, put your carrier on notice if you are going to probably eventually file a claim just so that they're prepared for it. You're kind of in the queue if you would because um, there's a lot of debate about is it the people who put in the claim first are going to be the ones that start seeing potential monies first if the government, state, or the carrier step up and pay the claim. Uh, but it's as simple as just putting in a notification saying, we've experienced business interruption loss. It's ongoing. It started on XYZ date. We think that we lost XYZ revenue to date and we'll keep you posted. And it's almost like a notice only type, type uh, claim you're reporting at this point in time. And along the way, you keep continuing collecting information, which again, I'll pass along to the call. And um, you know, admittedly, I, if I was a little more tech savvy, I could have brought it up on a screen here, but I honestly had a little bit of trouble even getting in. So I'm not even going to attempt doing that, but I will commit to getting it across to the folks after the call okay. on the information you should be collecting um, along the way. But it's simple. It's as much as an email, go to the, you know, you could call it in or email it. And I think the email documented trail tends to work a little bit better and you can refer back to it. Um, but it doesn't have to be anything fancy at this point in so, time. So uh, tenants don't have to like, for instance, keep a log of how of how the virus is affecting their business or how the order is affecting their business on a day-to-day -day basis or, or would you recommend doing that? Yeah, no, so that's a great question, Lee. So, and yeah, and good clarification. So the information I'll send post-call is gonna be a list of called seven items that we highly recommend that you keep a log of. Okay. And it's gonna be some of the information that's historical. You're gonna look at kind of how revenues looked over the past 12 months, um, but just showing where the revenue was 12 months ago versus where it started taking a dip, you're gonna to wanna to calculate that. Because for a, a carrier to go in and adjust a loss, if they're going to step up and pay for it, they're going to need that information. So you might as well collect it in real time, and that'll be a lot more easy for you when it comes to the final resolution of the claim. Again, you won't be getting down the path of, of trying to resolve the claim and looking for payment until you have the full business interruption loss play out. So if COVID-19 lasted you three months before, you know, before your income came back to normal, you're really looking to resolve the claim three months from now. If it took 12 months from now, which obviously I'm not, no, one's, no one's hoping for that, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's what I'm thinking either, but you would really be resolving the claim 12 months from now. So you're, it's about collecting the right information um, and, and either put your carrier notice now or just make sure that you have all the right information for when the proper time is that you do it. Um, you're not breaching at a reporting requirement by not re putting the claim in now, um, but if you do know you're going to put a claim in, I would say there's no reason to wait because you just put a notice in. It doesn't cost you anything. It sits there. And then, you know, you start letting the carrier know that at some point you'll be having a discussion with them. Um, another re reason I, I, I'm recommending to my clients to put a claim in, this gets in a little bit of the secondary item is, even if historically a virus wouldn't have triggered direct physical damage and wouldn't have allowed the policy to step in and respond, what we're already seeing from certain states, New Jersey got out of there quick, New York, California, Ohio, other states as well, 
where they're starting to come up with some legislation that they're trying to get passed. And, and, I'll, and I'll give a little bit more of the details, but basically mandating and forcing that insurance carriers that wrote policies for clients headquartered in such state must step up and pay a claim if you meet certain criteria. Where we're seeing the legislation start is typically if you're an organization of 100 employees or less, and maybe some type of financial, uh, some type of financial strength barrier. But the reason that we're so interested to see how these first claims, these first cases play out, is I think it's only the beginning of the of the tip of the iceberg, if you would, of what of what's to come. So if legislation starts getting passed, and even if it only starts for employees that have for employers that have 100 employees or less. I think it's very soon that you could start seeing additional legislation being passed for the larger organizations. And in some ways, if you look from a, a macro economy, um, you know, it's, it's equally important. The small business and the large businesses, you know, if there's going to be individuals losing jobs because companies can't afford to pay or there's no business income coming from anywhere, I uh, do you think you're going to start seeing the states and or the government at, at an even more macro level trying to figure out how do they solve this issue and, uh, you know, keep, kind of keep the economy moving in the right direction. So okay. that's all to you. One of the yep. issues there, which is kind of similar to how I expect some of the challenges to the executive order play out, is some of this legislation is drafted so hastily and so quickly, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be vulnerable to, to legal challenges. And then you have people who are maybe relying on the legislation and they're left kind of in the crosshairs when a court strikes down a portion of it or, or all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that there, there have been a few of these that have um, started to trickle in. Are you hearing anything? Are you getting any feedback from the carriers as to how they're viewing these claims or not yet? It's too early in the process. Yeah. So they're kind of they're kind of staying close to the vest. I mean, we're dealing because we do small personal lines, small business, middle market, and then Fortune 500 equivalent or so. Uh, we have trading relationships with with the largest insurance companies across the world. And, uh, and just to stay more for the U.S. perspective. Um, even before we got on here, I was talking to the head of AIG and prior to that, the head of Traveler. So they're expecting a flood of, of claims to be coming in. And I think they're in a little bit of a wait and see mode. Um, what, we're, what they're experiencing, and we're seeing this a little bit too, is where organizations are, they're still trying to figure out how, to, how are we going to keep going day to day at this point if you are getting impacted by COVID-19. And they're looking for avenues. So some folks have reached out, some have not. Um, so the floodgates hadn't been open really on the claims. And the carriers are also waiting to see, is it going to be kind of like a post 9-11 situation where the government did come in and give some type of backstop? Uh, but maybe another good reason why I put a claim in, because if you don't have a claim in, you really can't get paid out of anything. If you had a claim in and either a state or a government comes in with a backstop and now allows coverage to flow through, well, then you're, you can actually have a potential to get paid on a claim because you made a formal claim. So, um, so yeah, I think it's too early. The carriers are just trying to wait to see what it's going to look like. They're preparing. They're building up their claim staff. They're trying to build positions, but they're not. They're staying close to the vest, and they're trying to wait to see how things play out a little bit more. So it seems like like a no brainer first move. As long as you have insurance in some form to make a claim and just kind of see see what happens. Get yourself. I don't, see, I don't see any downside to it. I really don't. I think set the expectation that if you're not say the business owner, I wouldn't set the ex expectation that you're going to get a claim paid by any means, but I think with the right mentality of, we really have nothing to lose, even if it, there's an exclusion or it's silent, you gotta kind of be in it to win it if you would. And uh, there's really no downside. And it's interesting because in, you know, since 2002, like you mentioned before, I've been in, in the industry, I've, I've never had this, this, this take of, you know, you don't really know how a claim is gonna really play out. There's obviously gray matters that, that come up on one-off situations, but to this magnitude, um, it almost sounds like an irresponsible approach of just put the claim in and see what happens. But I really do think if you're being wise and if you're kind of staying close to your either insurance broker agent and they're watching and seeing things unfold, you got to have a claim in there because no one really knows where it's going to end up yet. Is it going to be state specific where they mandate certain, certain companies get paid, even though they shouldn't have? Is there going to be a federal backstop that comes in? If you don't make a claim, you're not going to be entitled for any of that. So there's really no downside, in my opinion, of putting a claim in. And it's not going to cost you a lot of work. I mean, obviously, you got to capture the data along the way. Uh, but I think you're probably going to be doing that in, in, to a large degree as you're trying to run the business. Um, you know, one thing that we're offering, too, this is, you know, this is, we're not trying to take over business, but just to help and be helpful to the, to the networking group here. If you needed a second set of eyes just to look at your policy to, to see, do you have the direct physical damage language? Do you have a, a set sublimit? Um, is there any other potential kind of angle to nuance in? 
Um, I'm sure Lee and Michael, I'm sure you guys are doing a lot of that work too. So, you know, if, if anyone needs any, you know, help behind the scenes for a second set of eyes, I offer that to, to the group if you find that helpful as well. Thank you. Yeah, because even as someone who's used to reading fine print all the time, it's it, it can be disorienting the way the policies are written. So that's yeah. 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 No good. And every policy you're going to see is going to be different. Even certain carriers have different forms and endorsements they're tagging on. So, um, you know, some of our clients have a big panel. You know, there's this 30 different carriers making up their insurance program. And, um, yeah, they're all subscribing to a general form. But this, the unique endorsements they're putting on does make it a little bit more uh, more of a manuscript feel. So it's, it's going to, to your point, you gotta look, you got to be looking at all that stuff. I was going to use the quarantine time to read my insurance policy from cover to cover anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Anyone having trouble sleeping, as we always say, start reading the policy around 10 o'clock. You'll be out in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. a, a whiskey in the insurance policy. Is the perfect yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. All right. Yeah. So Joe, we, we kind of covered um, whether there's going to be governmental, uh, you know, intervention. Um, I know there's a bill in New Jersey right now. It's, it, it hasn't been passed that would compel insurance companies to cover claims yeah. um, made by, I think just small business owners. In right, yeah. Is there a cutoff? Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. To your point, Lee. So right now that, that bill itself is capped at, you got to be in the state, you got to have a hundred employees or less. Right. So there is a cutoff. Um, so it's really more focused towards more small business owners. But again, we're, we're really excited to see where this goes because there could be an opportunity that if that passes, other states are going to do it. The threshold can start increasing. And I think the government's definitely watching as well as the carriers to start seeing if some of this legislation starts getting passed, the government's going to have to start stepping up, figuring out how we're going to put a backstop in. Um, I mention that because the insurance marketplace right now is already in a challenge environment where a lot of the insurance companies hadn't been making money just to more recent natural catastrophe events. So if they are now forced to pay claims for thousands and thousands of policyholders, it's going to put them in a very, very unprofitable situation. So it can actually, you know, put the insurance companies out of business, to, you know, to be honest, if I'm going to be direct about it. So that's where I think back to like a 9-11 situation where the government would be forced to step in. Um, they're keeping a very strong monitor on it as well. And, and we're talking to, you know, obviously very senior people at the organizations, but I mean, we're talking to the CEOs of, of AIGs and Ace Chubs and Liberties and Travelers. So we have the direct view in line of what they're seeing, what they're hearing. But uh, admittedly, it's just it's just too early. Um, New Jersey, to your point, we got out of the gate probably quickest and first. Um, and I've seen at least four or five states follow suit. So uh, if one goes down, you can see a little bit more of a domino effect. And the other thing we're watching is individual clients that are putting claims to their carrier. And the carrier have come back and said, oh, you know what, it doesn't trigger the policy. There's a couple cases that are already being litigated on the individual client level. So out in the Midwest, out in Louisiana, um, a lot of hospitality uh, and, and, and real estate so far are where those claims are coming in. But we're, we're tracking those, you know, literally daily too, because if there's any type of verdict that's made, it could just be the, you know, kind of a pointing direction of where the rest might, might wind up going. Uh, but it's too early. I think, you know, kind of checking in and having regular updates with, you know, with your insurance broker, forums like this, just kind of check in every couple of weeks and see what's moved. Um, things are moving probably quicker than I thought they would have. But I do think at the end of the day, it's going to take months before this all gets all gets kind of figured out and settled out. Right. If you're, if you, I mean, if you're following along, you have to follow along on the regulatory side. You have to follow along uh, as these cases start to get litigated on the legal side. Yeah. Legislation side. So it's going to be kind of following along on, on various tiers and figuring out um, how it's going to impact your business. Yeah. And I know, and obviously, you know, I'm at, maybe if I spent 10 minutes now, you know, if, if you need me back on to it, you know, every few weeks or every couple of months, and if you needed just kind of a, a quick two minute update, I'm happy to do that too, Lee. Yeah, and Great. Michael, too, if that helps you guys out too. Thank you. All right, Mike, let's move, let's move to the other side. Uh, take over and um, take a look at it from the, from the commercial broker perspective and maybe uh, brainstorm a little bit some creative solutions for landlords and tenants to try to collaborate and and work on this process together. Okay, well, thank you, Lee and Michael, for having me on. Um, keeping with the theme, it's pretty early to tell, pretty soon to know how landlords will react, and everything's sort of on a case-by-case -case basis right now. So I would say um, it's always good to communicate early and often with your landlord. This is, you know, taking a tenant's perspective. 
So if you're already feeling the impact to your business, there's no downside to starting to communicate that to your landlord. And, um, you know, we're all in this together. So depending on um, who the landlord is, obviously their willingness to work with you um, will, will differ. Um, the landlords that I've been in touch with are kind of open, not making decisions, but they're open to a conversation at this point. So we've, and we've already seen, I focus on, on office leasing, but we have seen already on retail that landlords are giving retailers a break. Um, they're giving them rent abatement in return for additional term on the back end. So if they get three months of free rent now, they just tack on three months at the end. To my knowledge, that's not happening yet on the office front, but I could certainly see um, that being a solution in certain um, situations. The other thing that is coming up for us is, okay, we have a tenant, they're constructing their, they're under construction on their new space with a different landlord, but they're likely to have delays. Are they gonna go into holdover in their current space? Um, and again, with that, it's reaching out to the landlord sooner rather than later, saying this might be an issue. Can we continue? And what, what we as a broker would, would recommend you propose is to just keep a current escalated rent and extend that for whatever period of time. And obviously, we don't know whether they're going to need an additional month, two months, six months. So... It's just about um, open communication at this point, kind of as you've alluded to, the, these leases are uh, written, um, you know, even if, if they're fair leases, they're still friendly towards the landlord. Apologies if anyone can hear the screaming in the background. So I think um, communication and, you know, friendly delivery um, at this point is, is the best way to go on that front and it can go through your the tenant directly it can go through their broker um it could certainly go through a lawyer but um you know at this point we don't we don't necessarily recommend it go on the lawyer's letterhead to to be um you know, we would say the first step should be kind of a friendly friendly discussion um so and then the other thing would be like just deferring the rent um and allowing rather than just going into monetary default and then curing it, coming up with an arrangement where um, the tenant is going to pay the rent at a later time. Um, you know, again, I, we, we haven't really seen most of these strategies materialize, so um, perhaps there'll be an update in a, in a few more weeks. That's the approach that we've taken so far is kind of, a, you put it nicely, it's, it's a friendly approach we're all in this boat together. This is unprecedented in the sense that a landlord, even if he is geographically diversified with his portfolio, he's, he's probably feeling this across the whole portfolio. And you'll have office tenants and retail tenants, uh, maybe not suffering to the same degree, but everybody's suffering a little bit. Uh, and we, we have seen tenants who feel more comfortable approaching the property manager or the landlord themselves. For the bigger landlords, we've had some tenants approach us and ask us to be an intermediary. But even when we're asked to do that, we have not written any lawyer letters. Uh, it's too early for that. I agree, Lauren. Uh, we've, we've reached out and kind of put it on the record that the tenant's unable to operate there. Uh, and I think our, our basic email, the intro email is, you know, this was the date that the tenant had to stop using the premises. What's your position with respect to rent? We kind right. of just, uh, and it's funny because me and Lee kind of initially brainstormed and wrote and rewrote a few things that we said, well, why don't we just put it out there? I mean, there's nothing clearly in the lease that governs. So what's the position? And, That's what Joe said, what's the downside, right? Yeah, what's I mean? the downside to asking? You're not, it, it, there's no anticipatory breach. You're not saying, well, we, we can't pay. So what are you, you know, what are you going to give us? It's just putting it out there that, hey, we, it's, it's, it's not a clear cut. Uh, it's not clear cut in the wording uh, or how this is all going to play out. So let's start the dialogue. Um, I had, there's actually a question that, uh, that Andrea put up here that maybe we can address. Cause one of the things that we haven't uh, talked about, we, we've mostly been talking about ongoing rent obligations, uh, but she had an, I see she just posted something else. Um, oh, this is in addition. So she's talking about a, a she's in a build out phase for her lease. And, uh, 
she's eating into her abatement period. Can you see this, Lauren, in the uh, comment? I, I can't see the question, but I have a, a, an idea of what she's saying. They're probably, they're delayed. And if she has a fixed rent commencement date, then she, it's eating, and, it, and they're like later than as anticipated, then it's eating into the free rent schedule. And unfortunately, you know, there are pros and cons to a fixed, um, as, as you all know, right, um, to fixing the rent commencement date. So if you're confident that you're, that their construction is going to be fast, then this can be advantageous to the tenant. And otherwise, it's better to put in the lease six months following delivery of the space. So if she has a fixed rent commencement date, then she is eating into the free rent period um, per the lease. Right. Yeah, I had a question for her also. So I, I was just asking her on the chat if she'd prefer to have her mic on. Uh, we can we can do it just with the running uh, chat also. But some of it also depends on, I guess, if the landlord is doing the build out. In a lot of cases, uh, you know, the rent commencement date is is tied to the delivery of the space with landlord's work completed. So it may be getting pushed out. Sorry, I was answering the question, assuming the landlord was building it out. You're absolutely yeah. right. Well, if, if, Andrea, you know, is that, uh, it, if, you, if you'd rather just type it in, is the landlord doing the build out or is the tenant doing the build out? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. So uh, this, is, this is Andrea and my husband, Will, is also here. How are you guys doing? Uh, thank, you, thank you very much for being hey very, very Top. helpful. Hey. Um, so to answer your question, uh, we are doing the build out, um, and we have a five month rent abatement period. Um, we actually have a six month that was given to us in year two. Prorated. Prorated. Uh, mm -hmm. Our construction um, and lease basically started um, on February 15th, and um, we, we kind of have two issues. First, the, the construction is challenged due to the, the COVID situation. Um, and in addition to that, we're also a fitness facility. So we definitely are not allowed to operate. Um, not, not that we could anyway, but, yeah. but it, you know, it, fundamentally, you know, we were, we, our business plan and strategy was to capitalize on the rent abatement period of, of time and, um, and be able to open when, when we are, are planning on deploying our marketing and PR and, and opening efforts. Um, so I, I also work, I work for a developer in the city and, and, uh, and manage construction. So we, fortunately we got a really good jump on this. So we're in a decent spot with the construction, but I'm losing my, the leg ahead that I, that I had. Um, it, does, it does allow us to plan and prepare a little bit better for materials and whatever, but uh, it definitely is going to be hindered and, um, um, and jeopardized for we don't know how long. Um, so really, it's a matter of a strategy of how, and we also have an SBA loan that was tied to the lease that started um, with construction. With construction, so so the, the clock started ticking uh, two fifty, and um, you know uh, the, we have a good rapport with landlord and SBA uh, company, and we're just trying to figure out the rest. You know, the best way to to mitigate. kindly work together to not all suffer here. I think we want to be careful about not giving direct legal advice in a call with, you know, 50 people on it. Um, we, for one, we don't know who's on the call. Um, and, you know, partially, just for other reasons too, but I think we can, you know, broadly speaking, I think we'd have to look at the lease and the, at the, the SBA loan because you don't want to be in violation of the terms of your loan as well with however you handle things. Right. Um, you know, Mike, are there specific provisions, uh, talking generally speaking about a situation where there's a build out in place and there's an abatement tied to that build out, are there provisions that um, tenants might want to look at or that they might want to have their, their professional providers look at? Yeah, I think uh, going back to the same provisions we were talking about, I think actually, again, Lee said it correctly that we would have to take a look at specifically what the worry of the lease says, but this is the kind of situation that I think a force majeure provision would apply to a little more easily than failing to pay rent. Uh, because you, even though there is construction ongoing in the city, uh, it's, it, it's unmistakably slowed down. Uh, we have some contractors that, you know, have chosen not to be out there. Uh, there's a smaller pool 
Uh, we've, we've seen, you know, the guidance that's being given by some general contractors saying don't share tools and maintain a safe distance. I mean, some of the restrictions that they're trying to put in place to get their crews, you know, working and, and keeping them working are a little bit impractical. So I think a landlord will be pretty sensitive uh, to the fact that you're having trouble uh, getting anybody to work or sticking to a timeline. So I, it goes back, the practical solution is the same. It's reaching out. Um, the landlord was already giving you an abatement for a reason, you know, so that you could improve the space that they own and operate a great facility there. Um, so I think it, you may have an easier time getting an extension of the rent commencement date or that rent abatement. Uh, maybe they choose to have it, uh, added to the prorated uh, abatement that's in your second year. Um, but I think it, the same theory is going to apply that the landlord still wants, the landlord is, is probably in a lot of ways uh, relieved that they were able to sign you and that you've gotten started. Uh, because if you weren't, if, if you hadn't signed and, and commenced your work, they might have a vacant spot where they'd have to wait a longer period of time to find somebody. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you have any other, you know, practical or business thoughts. I think, yeah, in framing the conversation, that's a great, that's a great point, Michael, is to just kind of remind them that, um, that you're improving upon the space, as you said, and that um, it's going in the long run, it's less downtime than they would have had if they hadn't signed you, you know, pre-virus, so. I agree, that was helpful, and, uh, you know, it's, thus far, we've really had a, a, a good and fair and uh, business relationship and, and understanding, so I think that starting off with a candid conversation of fairness and just supporting each other is, is, is relevant. So this was all very good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, guys. Sure. Sure. And I see Rob Stoltzman uh, is, is adding a little commentary on the side there. Can read, uh, you know, a riff on what we've been saying. Uh, let's see what David Friedman was writing to me. There was another question about, uh, they, somebody was asking for more discussion uh, about asking a landlord for an early termination uh, for the term. So again, that's that's something that it's it's not going to be a contractual right that's in your lease, right? I shouldn't say anything absolutely without seeing the lease, but I, I would be very surprised if there's an early termination right. It might be uh, it might be tied to interruption of services. There might be a, a termination right tied to that. So could be you most likely would see it if anywhere in a in a taking or a casualty provision where if this were a, a permanent state of affairs or if, if the taking provision had a certain number of, of weeks or months uh, you might have a termination right there so if you're looking in your table of contents again we're, we're happy to if, if you want to have a private discussion with us that would be privileged uh, and private we can uh, we could take a look but if you just wanted to take a look at your lease uh, it would look in eminent domain, uh, governmental takings, uh, regulatory takings. These are some of the things you might see in a table of contents. And that's most likely where you would find the termination right. Um, beyond that, you're probably looking at, again, like the business and practical solution. Um, this is maybe a good segue to talking about if, you, if you've exhausted your options and you know you're going to default, you cannot reopen. Maybe your debt, maybe your business is already so irreparably harmed by this that you know you just have to give the keys back. I mean, maybe you know, Lauren and I could talk a little bit about the type of guarantee you may have, if any. Um, depends. I, it looks like unless we get another question up, that might be another good thing to talk about. I think we're also coming into time, so I want to be conscious yeah, of uh, Lauren and Joe's time. Um, sure. And I also just want to make sure that we answered the question exactly right. Because the question that somebody asked was approaching the landlord for an early termination and negotiating a termination fee, um, which, you know, look, if you feel like it's going to depend on the length of your lease and a number of other factors, um, what kind of landlord it is. Is it a, again, is it an institutional landlord that has a larger portfolio or is it a mom and pop that's really reliant on, um, the stream of revenue coming from your business. Um, so those factors are all going to play in, but it's definitely an option. I mean, depending on the, on the various factors, um, you know, it, it is something that 
you could approach your landlord with, but there are, there are so many other factors that play in, you know, does, does the landlord uh, need to have an occupied space for their own lending requirements? So there is a number of factors that, that play in there. Um, any, any kind of final thoughts, uh, Joe, from an insurance perspective, we're gonna, we're gonna log off and make this available for people um, by video, but any final thoughts? Joe? It might oh, be on sorry. I, I didn't know you were just me. Sorry, Nick. No, no, no final thoughts here. I'm sorry, Nick. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I thought you were, I thought you were reading an insurance, I thought you were reading an insurance policy. <laughs> yes, yes. Let's just be happy I got onto the call. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, we appreciate no. both your time, really. It's, yeah. Uh, no, same here. Same here. And, um, yes. Lauren, Lauren any, any final thoughts from you? Any, uh, final thoughts that a tenant should be thinking about when they're trying to figure out how to approach the next couple of weeks? I think we're all just trying to hang in there, um, be, you know, relatively optimistic and know that New York is, is a strong city and we'll all get through this together, but, um, over communicate with all parties and, um, hope for the best outcome possible. There, there's no better time than right now to be transparent and communicate with people because everybody's willing to listen. Everybody's willing to, most people are willing to be empathetic to a certain extent. Um, so now that, that might go away. It probably will go away. We know from history that um, <laughs> as we get further and further away from a crisis, people are less likely to be sympathetic and work with you. So now's the time to, to get moving on whatever your, your business interests are trying to take advantage, not advantage of the situation, but trying to understand what the situation is and, and work with landlord or tenant to a solution that makes sense for everyone. Great. All right, um, we're gonna get this up on video. Thanks for everybody for chiming in. If you have questions after, you can um, obviously email us or, or let us know some other way. And Joe, we'll look forward to, you said you were gonna send a resource around that we'll try to yeah. circulate. Yeah, perfect. Great. All right, have a great, uh, what, what, what night is it? Wednesday? I know, it's hard to get Thursday. <laughs> Thursday, it used to be a favorite night and now it's- It's almost the weekend. It's <laughs> almost the weekend. Have a great Thursday night, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joe and Lauren. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye.